The officer said the police don't know why the mother headed south. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, a podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode 23 of season 5, and we are continuing our Summer of Kaiju, this time with a short story by Paul Tremblay. This time we're discussing the Paul Tremblay story, Swim Wants to Know If It's As Bad As Swim Thinks. Now, this story first appeared in the magazine Bourbon Pen. It was in the eighth issue. Uh, I think you can actually still find it online if you want to read uh, the story. It's relatively short, so it's a pretty quick read. It also appeared in the year's best weird anthology, which was edited by Laird Barron. Um, in a series that was curated by Michael Kelly that came out, I believe, with Undertow Press. And then the story was republished in Tremblay's uh, 2019 story collection, Growing Things, which is a fantastic collection. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, in Growing Things, he actually includes in the back of the book notes on all the different stories, which I must say, one of the things I really enjoy about short story collections is you get to usually uh, get some notes from the author on, you know, what was going on at the time they wrote the story or what they were thinking about or what they were influenced by. And in the back of this, um, in the back of Growing Things, Tremblay talks about what, uh, ta what he uh, was inspired by for this story. So in it, I'm just going to read you a little bit of what he says, because I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, he says that he loves giant monsters. And this is a quote from him. He says, I love giant monsters. Well, in theory, I'm sure I wouldn't like them if they were around smashing, stomping, and eating all this stuff. Let me rephrase. I love giant monster stories. I like to think I have a giant monster novel in me somewhere. I'm going to put a little note on that and say that I really hope he does have a giant monster story in him somewhere like a, a novel because that would be fantastic but he goes on to talk about how the first really horror movies he ever watched were kaiju movies and in specifically he mentions Godzilla movies he said that there was a local channel that he used to watch growing up that on Saturday afternoon would show creature double feature programs. And the first movie would almost always be one of these kaiju movies. So through that, he watched things like Godzilla, Rodan, all this killer shrews, giant leeches. These are some of the ones he lists. And then he always says the second movie would be a non-giant monster horror movie. And that one would always be the one to give him nightmares. But obviously, these kaiju movies, these giant monster movies really made an impression on him. And so he wanted to tackle writing one into a story. And it fits really well with what we're talking about. I think in particular, us um, since we've been looking at the development of Kaiju, really, we've started with Godzilla and we watched Mothra. And then we've watched some newer ones like Colossal in particular, I'm thinking about. Um, which that movie really works well with his story, Swim wants to know if it's as bad as Swim thinks, because the monster kind of works as a metaphor. Now, in this story, it's not as, I think, clear cut, because what's happening in the story is happening alongside a giant monster invasion. But there are some similarities. So I'm going to stop talking about kind of the publication history of this story. I'm going to throw it over to either Mel or Matt just to get their initial thoughts on this story. Well, I guess I'll go first. 
I read this story, I think right after I got the collection Growing Things. So I ended up reading it from Growing Things and not the Bourbon Pen website. Um, and it was very memorable to me. I mean, there's a few memorable stories in this in this collection, but it was one of the ones that kind of stuck in my head because of the kaiju aspect. I remember just kind of being like almost delighted that this could be a giant monster <laughs> movie slash story. So that's my first impression is just I thought it was cool that I'm reading this short story and it's kind of like a kaiju story. But reading it this time, after we talked about Colossal, I think you're right, Lisa, to point to that one. Because in that one, you know, you have a woman with with alcoholism, substance abuse issues, who finds out that her behavior is connected to this monster. We talked about how it's the idea of managing the monster within yourself. In this story, we have a, a woman with substance abuse issues, drug issues, and that has kind of messed up her life. And I'm sure we'll talk specifically about how, like, what's going on with her. And you also have this kaiju uh, monster happening kind of in the background of her life as she's trying to, to work her way through this. One last thing I want to say that I found interesting about this story before I pitch it to Matt is the ambiguity in it. And, you know, we've had Paul Tremblay on the podcast before, and I've read different things that he's written about writing. And he very much is like a a fan of horror's ambiguity, how you can read something and you can't know maybe necessarily what is particularly happening because you could find evidence in a story for either eventuality. And that was one of the things that really struck me too, reading this story now twice, is because I feel like, and this is something we need to discuss, but I feel like you can read this story as if there is a kaiju attack happening and this woman is trying to deal with her issues, her personal issues and, and struggles, but I think you can also read it as if it's not necessarily like a kaiju is destroying everything. It's that it's her issues manifesting almost like as a metaphor. Uh, the monster is a metaphor for the problems that she's having. Because the whole story, there's like a nor'easter happening. And you don't know if it's like in a kaiju movie where the monsters are causing it or if it's a storm that she has misinterpreted. And plus, she is, a, you know, she's she's a... Uh, she's on medication or she's on you know uh, drugs while this is happening so it's always unclear what she is perceiving and I thought that that use of ambiguity was really interesting because it even if you read it as like it's a monster story there's still connections I think like the movie Colossal so yeah watching Colossal before I reread the story was really fascinating kind of connections between the two and I kind of feel like reading or I kind of feel like watching Colossal might have jogged my memory on this one because I actually asked y'all if we could do a short story because I just kind of assumed we'd be doing kaiju movies the whole summer but I was like wait Colossal reminded me of this story by Paul Tremblay so I definitely think this is a good way to follow up our, our Colossal episode. Uh, Matt what are some of, what are some of your first impressions? Well uh, I was actually saying this before we started recording as well, just kind of in our, our pre-recording discussion, that this was my first time reading this story. I've had a copy of Growing Things for a while, but I I just have not had a time to dive into it very much. Uh, other things seem to keep getting my attention. And I think that's just changed because, well, I, I liked the story quite a lot. Um, and well, I've always loved Paul Tremblay's work and I, I don't know why I've sat on this one for so long, but my initial thoughts, I guess, were very similar to yours, Mel. Um, I, I do feel like, same as you, that there are a lot of parallels between this and Colossal. And and I think you've, you've already kind of pointed them out, so I'm not going to belabor that point too much, but I, I noticed those as well. And uh, same same with the unreliability of the narrator. I'm... I'm always a fan of an unreliable narrator because I, I do feel like that's a very kind of true to life thing uh, in a lot of ways that, you know, we always are the hero in our own stories, even if we're the villain in somebody else's. And and in her case in particular, she was extremely unreliable because like, like you said, she was, well, she was on meth for the entirety of the story, it seems like. And uh, yeah, it, it was less kaiju than I expected, but still had the, a good amount of kaiju, I guess, if you will. Uh, but li like you said, there, there's definitely a lot open to interpretation as to whether or not 
there even were kaiju at all or it was just the drugs talking to her as someone who's never actually done methamphetamine uh I, i'm not super aware of its effects other than the fact that it's a stimulant i i know it's not really a hallucinogen but I, i'd imagine that in large enough doses it will alter your perception in, in pretty interesting ways uh interesting not in a good way i should say i'm not advocating for the use of meth by the way but yeah I, I overall i guess that's kind of my first impression i noticed a lot of the same things that you had just pointed out when you were talking about it and i i really liked it like pretty much everything i've read by paul tremblay it's been a little off and a little interesting and really really good yeah they, there were so many things i loved about this story i think one of them is i mean of course we you both have said it and I'm going to say it again, but <laughs> Paul Tremblay is so good <laughs> in what he writes. Like, I just, the way he can build suspense in a story uh, really early on without really saying too much, because he does play, Mel, as you were talking about, the uh, with ambiguity so well and like just kind of sitting in that and not letting the reader know really what's going on until much, much later, usually towards the end. And then sometimes even with some of his stories, you never really know. It's just, he leaves you there. Um, but one thing s struck me was it was the first, the very first paragraph of the story when it opens. <clears throat> so it opens and you know something has gone wrong um, because by the end, it says that they, the end of this little opening, that they had made the TV news and the papers and like there was a, there were police involved and that's usually never good. But um, it talks about somebody being on the road, like on a road trip. But then there was one sentence and it says, the trees had orange leaves when we started and green ones when it was over. And I just remember kind of sitting there and like taking in that sentence and thinking, man, like he didn't tell us anything really scary or horrific in that sentence, but I am so unnerved because I want to know what happened. Either <laughs> they drove a really far distance or they were driving so long that the seasons changed and either way i'm really unnerved <laughs> like it's just i don't know it's just the way he can kind of construct the ideas and the syntax that is just unnerving or maybe it was just because i knew i was going into a paul tremblay story so i was on edge but um we do get the story from the bomb's point of view and as both of you have said she's she is impaired, so we don't know how much we can trust. But even then, as we're unraveling her character and learning more about her, I still didn't know where this was going. I had never read this story before. I have growing things. I, I bought it as soon as it came out, but I'm one of those people. I never read story collections in order. I always kind of bounce back and forth between the stories, which probably really annoys the authors to hear that because they put them in order for a reason. But, you know, I'll just, I'll kind of go through and pick the ones I want to read. So I hadn't read this one yet. But really, we don't know too much. We know that there was some sort of incident where the police were involved, and, and it was bad enough that it made the news. And then we know that the mother has a daughter. Uh, we learn later it's it's an eight-year-old named Julie. And But how we learn this is that we meet the soccer coach. And I thought this was a really interesting interaction because it gives us a lot about the character. So you meet Brian Jenkins, who is the youth soccer coach. And she's, she's looking at him as he's buying oranges. And she said, or she's thinking, oh, I, I guess he's going to take those to the game and cut them up and, and the, give the oranges to the soccer players. Which right away kind of sign signals to the reader that something isn't right because the mom isn't going to the soccer game. And she says um, that he can barely look me in the eye. So again, 
it's okay. This is not a normal interaction between the mom of an eight-year-old and the eight-year-old soccer coach. And then she says, I never signed up to be their boogie woman. And that, again, really struck me because I knew this was going to be a kaiju or kaiju adjacent. <laughs> I knew there was going to be a giant monster in, of some, in some way because Mel had suggested it. And as soon as I read that line, I was like, oh, is, is this going to be like an instance? And Colossal was kind of on my mind, too, where I was like, is this going to be, you know, something where maybe the mom turns into a kaiju or maybe she's connected to one like psychically, <laughs> like in Colossal, like what what is going on here? But just that fact that you know, she calls herself kind of the town boogie woman and that everybody seems to know who she is and like they want to stay away from her. I don't know. I just, I thought that was a really interesting way to introduce us to the main character in this type of story. Of course, then we learn later that she does have issues with meth. And specifically, there was a reference to Yaba, which I had did not know about. I had to look it up when I was reading the story. And apparently it is you know, crystal meth in tablet form. So it's caffeine and methamphetamine that you ingest in some sort of way. You either like smoke it or in this case, she talks about, um, because she's part of this like online message board and she asks if it's, if it's bad to um, eat it on an empty stomach. So we're supposed to assume, I guess, that that's what she's doing. But apparently when I looked it up, it's called the madness drug. So that, that's kind of another name for it. So it, it is known for being, I guess, hallucinogenic and causing, I mean, I guess in like madness when people use it. So that just adds to it. Yeah. You know, like right, right away. But that doesn't, we don't even get that until probably about halfway through the story we just are, are kind of given pieces like little breadcrumbs about who this woman is, but we know something's going on with her. So yeah, I don't know. I thought that was a really, really fascinating way to construct the story. And I thought it was really well done. Yeah. I like the bits and pieces that we get about her as the story moves on because we know that everybody in the town is judging her because something has happened. I mean, Another thing I love about Paul Tremblay's stories is that at times they'll use kind of like postmodern collage techniques. And so you just get all these fragments and you have to kind of put it together. And he he does that here. It seems like to me that Julie was taken from her probably because of her addiction. And then there was the incident we find out later because she starts to get past and present confused. And she's like talking to Julie when she kidnaps her about or takes her for her own safety. We don't know. Um, about when she was a child and apparently there was an incident where she like used a knife to take Julie away from her mom, Julie's grandmother. And then we find out that, you know, she, we know she has a handgun with her when she goes to get Julie this time. So we don't know what she did to Gran as she's called in the, in the story, but there's these little crumbs and bits and pieces, like even in the beginning where you're not sure why everyone's judging her, she admits that even though she's supposed to stay a certain distance away from Julie and her mom. She goes and tries to watch the soccer games from a distance. Uh, she talks about walking around the block and hearing things from inside Grant's house. So that's definitely pretty close. She's afraid that the soccer coach is going to yell at her and call her out for being too close to Julie. And, you know, toward the end of the story, when we find out that she's been in the house across the street or a little ways that she used to run away to when she was a kid, she talks about how she practiced everything, which was really disturbing to me because up until that point, you're like, oh, she knows they're giant monsters and she wants to rescue Julie. And then we realize that she's been living in that house watching them. And she says, practice, 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 practice makes perfect. And so you get these little, like, every time you start to like trust her, you get some sort of jarring realization that her paranoia is heightened or maybe she's hallucinating or what the heck has she done before? And I thought his way of like doling out those little bits of information just made her such a complex character. I mean, that's what you do when you're writing a story, right? But <laughs> I like that kind of fragmentation of narration, which mimics kind of her fragmented mind. 
she even talks about there's two of her when she's high it's the someone who isn't me who does things while she is blacked out so that's why she calls herself swim when she thinks she's doing things that she wouldn't typically do and so i don't know it's just really interesting kind of way we we get her feelings about herself and her mom and her daughter in this story that's kind of a kaiju story but we're just kind of given these little pieces of the puzzle that we can then kind of put together as we go, which, which I just find uh, so satisfying as a reader, even if I don't know precisely what happened at the end and I'm kind of frustrated, <laughs> I still like the fact that I can go through and like point at different things and get a piece of it or make some sort of interpretation. Uh, yeah. Paul Tremblay, if you're listening to this, since I know you have had us on or <laughs> I know since we've had you on this podcast once before, I just want to say I, I echo Lisa's sentiment about wanting to see a full-length kaiju novel in your hands. Uh, we've already seen a zombie novel and a possession novel, and I've loved both of them. So please, please, please do a full length. But I, I just wanted to say, too, that uh, no, I, I like what you're saying, Mel, about the, the postmodern collage of, of kind of doling out information, but we kind of have to work a little harder to put it together. And I, I mean, I honestly feel like having never been a drug addict, it's hard to fully imagine what that must be like. And so I, I can't, I can't speak to the accuracy of this from, from a, you know, a truth perspective from, from, from someone who's actually lived it. But uh, I can only imagine that having, I do have family members who have gone into AA and they have mentioned that there is sort of that, you know, sober version of you and the drunk version of you. So that, that kind of really resonated with me too. Uh, when, when the narrator is talking about that, uh, the, the someone who isn't me when she's, when she's high, that really kind of struck a chord for me. And at the same time, yeah, it kind of made me doubt her even more as to the truth of what was really happening because like you just said there was that really disturbing moment of when she says that she's practiced this before but then also and i know we're getting kind of towards the end of the novel and i don't want to jump jump straight to the end but the the kaiju or the nor'easter or something at least from the perspective of of her destroys the grandmother's house and Julie is, you know, screaming and upset and worried about her grandmother screaming, you know, about Gran. And so that gives me at least enough cause to think that Julie sees it as well. But of course, we don't know what actually caused it. But, you know, there was a part of me that was like, oh, well, this may have the unintended consequence of being a good thing for the daughter, for Julie. But if the mother has been practicing this and secretly sort of living and watching from this empty house that's being renovated. I mean, that's really disturbing. Even if she did inadvertently save her, her daughter's life. I mean, she was trying to sort of, but it seems like she, like, well, like you said, she kind of planned something for, for taking her again. And that, I don't know. He just did a, such a great job of, again, with the ambiguity, but also not just the ambiguity, the, the tension of it, of not really knowing her motivations, because I think at some level she didn't fully know herself. You know, she was, she was kind of, seemed like she was acting out of more impulse and intuition than she was true, like fully formed thought. Is, is that making sense? No, I think that makes a lot of sense because you know, she even says at one point, I think it's when she's on the message board, she says she can't stay long and be on the computer because she has to go to the house again tonight, which we we find out, like you were saying, Matt, that's the, the partially renovated house that she goes to and watches Julie. We don't know that at this point, but she says that. And then she says, I have no choice. Living without choices is easier. And I do feel like there is this like paranoid impulsiveness, but there's also this, like she's, Besides the fact that she isn't herself when she's high, she also her her internet handle is not really here. She says she feels fated to do certain things. I think there's this. She's kind of in this place where she feels like she has no choices. Like no choice is going to get her back with Julie, or no choice 
can get her into a you know a better relationship with her mother which we assume was not great even when she was a kid um yeah i definitely think that idea of her like feeling like almost slotted on tracks to do these things till she gets to the end where she's like you know her julie's obviously scared and i i think there's an implication that she's also she's scared of her mom in addition to being scared of whatever is happening outside and it's almost like we were fated to get there from the beginning because of that intro that lisa talked about where we know that this has happened before this idea of like this is just how it's got to be and this is what i have to do and i think that's also really disturbing as well that she's gotten to the point where she doesn't see a way out other than whatever this is and she has the gun which is also an extremely disturbing touch because we we don't know what she's done with it at this point we don't know what she will we're not sure what she will do with it yeah the gun is one of those things that i want to return to (laughs) because it it kind of haunts the story a little bit and anytime I mean well number one anytime you're in a Paul Tremblay story you know bad things are coming (laughs) so yeah I right away but 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 also you know when you're reading a short story when a, a writer plants a gun it's gonna come back into play at some point so I do want to talk about that But first, I kind of want to talk about, since this is a kaiju story, or like at least influenced by, or this is his take on that line or that like genre of story, this kind of giant monster, I think we've done a really good job kind of describing the main character's mindset throughout. And I I like the way y'all have been talking about her as though like, she is, she does feel like she's two people in some sort of way because of her addictions and the the idea, but even, even beyond that, the idea that she feels like she doesn't have a choice in the matter and that she's somehow fated to kind of go through and, and act these things out. And also just that she doesn't have a grip really on what is happening in the past and what is happening in the present because she kind of goes back, back and forth through that. But I, I want to talk about the the first time we see the the giant monster, and I'm using kind of air quotes around the word "see" there, because what we actually see on the page is a news video. So she is at work at at her grocery store job, and she's with her coworker Darlene. Now she's already complained about Darlene about how she doesn't like working with her because Darlene will often like work on her line and bag her groceries, but Darlene is slow and slows her down and she doesn't like working with her. But later she's talking to Darlene and Darlene shows her a video that she sees on her, that she's watching on her phone. And Darlene says, she asks her what she's watching. Darlene says, well, it's a news video. Something terrible is happening. Something weird came out of the ocean. Then she whispers, looks like giant monsters. So I think this is key (laughs) to kind of at least how I read the story. Mel, you already mentioned there's a nor'easter blowing or that that comes up uh, later in the story. So I'm assuming that they're watching like a news video of the weather and I have, I live on the coast and I will tell you that when storms come up, crazy things happen over the ocean, um, all sorts of like water spouts and just watching wind and rain and what it, what it looks like, like in particular, I've seen like hurricanes rolling in and it just looks wild. I mean, it looks wild that, so I, I kind of wonder if that's what she's seeing, but she says that she gets close to Darlene and she looks at this this video playing on the phone. And this is what she says she sees. What little I see looks like footage from one of the cable networks. A news ticker crawls along the bottom of the screen. Can't make out the words. I think I see what looks like giant waves crashing into shoreline homes and then a dark shape, smudge, shadow, something above it all. And maybe it has arms that reach and grab. And Darlene squeals, oh my God, there it is, and starts pacing a tight circle around nothing. And then that's when our main character here starts saying, oh, you know, it's fake. It's just, I bet it's a trailer for a new movie. You know, there's always a new monster movie coming out. That's got to be what it is. And And Darlene's like, no, this is the news. What are you talking about? It's happening. Everybody's talking about it. 
And that's when they kind of get chased off by their manager and they can't watch the video anymore. But to me, because what we get is we know there's a video of the storm rolling in, right? Like we know that's what it is because it, she talks about what she sees is the giant waves crashing into the shoreline homes. And then some something that looks like a smudge or a shadow or a dark shape. That's what she sees. But what she hears is Darlene saying that it looks like giant monsters. So again, we're living in ambiguity here because we're in a Tremblay story. <laughs> but either it is a nor'easter rolling in and it's like maybe water spouts over the ocean or something, you know, kind of weird and strange going on with the wind and the waves and the water. And Darlene thinks it looks like a monster. And then that is enough to plant that in our, you know, main character's fractured head. Or it's an actual kaiju attack that is just starting. Because almost every classic kaiju movie <laughs> starts with the monster coming up from the sea in some sort of way and kind of rolling in towards the city. So that's what I find really fascinating is how he builds that in there because i mean when you really i think pare it down it seems like it's just a nor'easter that that kind of one line from darlene was enough to plan it in our character's head but i don't know like maybe she is trying to go save her daughter from an actual kaiju attack even though She's also hallucinating on drugs and cannot in any way take care of her daughter. I don't know. What, it, what is your take on the actual monster itself? Well, rereading it this time, when I read that part that you read where she's with Darlene, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, this must just be the storm. Because like you said, there's so many words that indicate to us that this is uncertainty. And she doesn't quite believe Darlene at that point, which I think makes it really difficult, as Matt mentioned earlier, to know what is even motivating her to go get the daughter. Like, we hope it's because she's a mom and wants to protect her, but because of all the other stuff we talked about, we don't know if maybe this is just, like, happening at the same time. A little bit later in the story, when she's with Julie in the other house, she talks about how she, so I think it's when she's at Tony's house and then here she hears like this rumbling, which kind of <laughs> reminds me of like the, the, the boom, boom, like when things are, you know, Godzilla's coming, right? And so she goes outside and she says, the world size breathes and it's so loud. It's like a whale reaching in my head. And then she talks about how trees are falling, which if you're in a nor'easter with a lot of snow and ice, I could see that happening, though it seems, you know, it is very localized here. She talks about she hears sirens, and then she says, and the world sign stuff, it isn't just in my head, you know. And that disturbed me <laughs> because on the one hand, I feel like I'm in a kaiju movie because you got rumbling, banging, and this weird, like, breathing of a large animal. But she begins by saying she feels like it's in her own head, and then she's like, no, it's not. And I'm like, is this person reliable? That's my main question. And then she talks about how the monster destroys Grand's house. And she sees she sees the fog coming from the monster's noses, apparently, because she says there are three, no four separate clouds from walking smokestacks. Holy Christ, it's Darlene's video. They're here and they're walking and breathing somewhere above everything. And then she talks about how the house is falling. But like Matt said earlier, we don't know for sure what's happening to Grand's house. And then she describes them as giant shadows, again, and not a very concrete word, but with giant boulders attached to giant arms or giant legs. I don't know which. And they pile drive into the house, smashing the chimney and walls, glass shattering, wood exploding, and always those white plumes of breath above it all, breathing slow but loud and constant like they'll never stop. And like Matt said earlier, we do have Julie screaming, so she must see something too. But we're still in our unreliable narrator's head. So even though I want to be like, yes, this is a kaiju story, I still find myself pulling back a little bit and wondering, because we still are getting some of those words that you mentioned earlier, Lisa, like shadows and you know, and it's like, 
And obviously, let's say we're in the real world and a kaiju attack happens, it would be difficult to describe from the ground precisely what's happening in the dark. So, you know, I want to give her that benefit of the doubt, but if she's impaired in some way, I just don't know how trustworthy she is. And then at the end, she kind of identifies the monster with herself because she says they're going to ride the monsters out of town, basically. So... I don't know. I, f I, f I want the monsters to be real and I can find some evidence in the story. I think that they could be, or at least something weird is happening. But at the same time, I'm like, this is an, this is an unreliable narrator. And if you read the language really carefully, it doesn't give you a lot of purchase. It could go either way, depending upon whether we can trust her at that particular moment. Cause the only thing Julie says to her the whole time they're together is, do you still have that gun? So Julie doesn't say, oh, my God, I saw a huge dinosaur tearing up Grand's house. So it's really difficult to say what's happening. Yeah, I think the, the when I read it for the first time, I was kind of on the side of, oh, this is a story about a meth-addicted woman trying to save her daughter from a kaiju attack. <laughs> when I read it through the second time, I started to pick up on the fact that Nobody else really spoke about the giant monsters. Um, Darlene said they looked like giant monsters, but it, it was a very quick exchange that they had. And she says, everybody's talking about it, but we don't really know what it means. I mean, I'm guessing it means the storm that every, cause that makes sense. Everybody would talk about it. And then when we see again, in air quotes, the monster's attack, it's all from the main character's point of view. You know, she says the monsters are giant shadows with giant boulders attached to giant arms or giant legs. I don't know which. And they pile drive into the house, smashing the chimneys and walls, glass shattering, wood exploding, and always those white plumes of breath above it all, breathing slow but loud and constant. But they'll never stop. And that's when Julie opens the window and starts screaming for Gran. But again, we yeah, we don't we don't see the monsters through anybody else's eyes and nobody else comments on them. Julie only screams for Gran and then asks if she has the gun. So yeah, looking at it through that point of view, like if you kind of exit out of the main character's head and and look at okay, what do we know is happening? then it, it almost seems like she just kidnapped her daughter in the middle of a nor'easter and everything else is her own hallucinations that we get. So I don't know, really super well, really super well done. I just want to point out really fast that, you know, if we do like you're saying and we, we kind of forget about the main character, it does seem like a violent kidnapping. Because, yeah, I mean, you're right. Julie screams for Grant. What would Julie do if a person that she thinks is, if she had just been kidnapped at gunpoint from her grandmother, she would scream for her grandmother and they're within screaming distance. And in the next what two pages, there's the implication that Grant might have been shot in the kidnapping because she says... She remembered Gran yelling about how she had cancer. So just go on and do it. Go ahead, she said. Go ahead and do it, she said. Just do it. And I asked Julie if she remembers Gran saying that. And damn it, I'm mixing up what happened when Julie was a baby and happened tonight. So she doesn't even remember exactly what happened. But the fact that Julie screams for Gran and then asks if she has a gun it makes me think something really bad happened at the house, not just a kidnapping. Right, absolutely. Um, and the fact that... Uh, towards the end, there seems to be the, the emphasis on, like, she keeps telling her not to be afraid. She keeps telling Julie not to be afraid. And there was a moment, oh, that really kind of broke me when I was reading it. First, she yells at her. It's, it's right when Julie opens the window and starts screaming for Gran. And I think you're right. I think the implication is that Gran was shot. Um, and she's, she's screaming for help, but she's also screaming to see if she's okay. And and the her mom's reaction is to scream back at her and tell her to shut up, to stop being a baby. Why are you so stupid? They'll hear you. I and then later, she says. Later, she says, "I I tell her they'll see her." You know, she says, "Stop looking out the window. They'll see you." I say it in my quiet, "I'm sorry" voice, and that really struck me because I thought this is a pattern between 
them of the mom like losing her cool losing her temper losing whatever and yelling at the daughter not just yelling at her but probably yelling horrible things and then having to like pull it back and apologize and um that whole time she's kind of talking about herself and she's also talking about swim so it, it again she's like balancing these two parts of her personality i don't know it was really um that second time reading it the abuse really or the pattern of abuse that i imagine has happened here really stood out to me and really struck me and and then just just the fact that she talks about wanting to like she keeps telling her daughter there's nothing to be afraid of like obviously the daughter is terrified and she keeps talking about wanting to get her somewhere safe and then she references towards the end that ride that they started with she says we will feel the earth rumbling beneath us and we'll be above everything so she's talking about something that's going to happen in the future but she says i tell her it'll know where to go where to take us and it'll take us where it's safe safe for swims i tell her that i know she doesn't remember the first time but we'll ride it south again the monster will follow the dotted white lines and instead of trees lining the roads there will be all the rest of the monsters destroying everything else watching us leading the way south not sure why south swims south but maybe it's as simple and as stupid as that's where everything is green because south isn't here because south is as good or bad as any other place and that's when the police show up so you know again this is like a pattern with them and really kind of heartbreaking and i don't think that the the police would show up <laughs> with their flashing lights pounding on the doors in the middle of a kaiju attack but yeah when they do sh show up julie's yelling and crying and then this is where it really kind of hits home and he just kind of pulls us out of the story really quick but the police are outside things are not going well and <sighs> One of the last lines is, you know, she she's Julie's yelling and crying. She's whispering, says, or we learn that Tony's gun is in my other hand. So Julie is in one hand and Tony's gun is in the other hand. And this is how he ends the story. I tell Ju Julie, shh, baby, don't you worry about nothing. Your mom's here. And again, it's that gun <laughs> that has now showed up and that now we're like terrified because we're almost positive she's shot Gran and now she's got her daughter and we don't know don't know what she's going to do with it. Um, we know that she intends to take her south, uh, that she doesn't want to hurt her daughter, but at the same time, we know we can't trust really anything that she's going to do because she's got, you know, she's she has a history of becoming two people, as she says, and there's swim and there's her but yeah I'm, I'm kind of with you mel the more i read this and the more i kind of look at everything it just seems like we're he pulls us up he tells us the story about a kidnapping and he pulls us out at the very end right before we kind of find out what happens like we have no idea if julie's okay if grand's okay really anything which is frustrating but also kind of wonderful <laughs> it's one of the reasons i enjoyed the story yeah it's really well constructed and there's even if there's even a few ways to look at the end like i mean i feel pretty badly about the end because she's just gone completely uh, this isn't the correct t technical term i guess but like disassociated because before she drove south now she's talking about the monsters and i i don't think the child is safe or she is safe or the police are safe or any whatever's going to happen next but that I think the end kind of uh, juxtaposes swim and her, like the person she's not and the person she is. Because in one hand she's cut, uh, holding her daughter, and the other hand she has a gun, like two different people almost. And the end, she's like, "I tell Julie, like you said, to you know, don't worry about nothing. Your mom's here." To end on that is terrifying. But at the same time, there's all, it's like, is it that the mom is back or is, because up until that, when she's talking about the monster, she keeps talking about swim will do this and this will be safe for swims. 
So I don't, I think even the end plays with that idea of we don't know precisely who we're dealing with. Are we dealing with whoever, because I don't think we ever get a real name, whoever this woman is as a mother, or are we dealing with her as the swim? So it's like, I guess what I'm saying is, has the mom come back at the end and this isn't going to be good, but maybe the absolutely terrible thing we think could happen won't happen? Or is it like you're saying, Lisa, it's like horror all the way down <laughs> where she's desperate and she's impulsive and we have no clue what she's going to do. But I definitely think we see the tension and conflict between her two personas, in quotation marks there at the end, with the child on one side and the gun on the other. Um, and and there's no, there's not really any good way that this could this could end, basically. So I think now that we're completely terrified and depressed, that might be a good way, a good time for us to stop talking about this story. I feel like even though we've talked about the end, we could like go back and forth on so many other things in the story as well. And we don't want to go over our, our uh, typical runtime. So we hope that you enjoyed our discussion of this story. We hope that if you're a fan of Paul Tremblay and you haven't gotten to this collection, you check it out. Or maybe if you haven't read any other Paul Tremblay and you're interested, maybe check out the short stories as a way to get into his work. I just really enjoyed reading this. I'm glad we were able to work it into our summer of Kaiju. So if you do read this story or if you're aware of the story and you're like yelling things at your uh, uh, radio or iPhone or whatever it is your computer listening to this on because uh, you have things to say about it, feel free to contact us and let us know what you think. We're at No Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram and we have a Facebook page. We also have an email, so you could send us an email if you would like um, about this episode or our Summer of Kaiju. And our email is nofearcast at gmail.com. If you really enjoy what we're doing, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can get access to exclusive content. So for $5 a month, you get access to many episodes in between weeks of our main episodes where we maybe go into a little bit more detail about something or talk about something that might have been a tangent in a main episode. But we completely understand if that's not financially possible right now, so you can always simply rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you listen to this. And that is entirely free and it helps other listeners to find us. As always, theme music by Nicholas Gasparini. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.